Oh, here we go. How long have we been on, Isaiah? Uh, three seconds. Three, three seconds. seconds. It happens. Every uh, we now should have. We should have been paying better attention. Yeah. Uh, but hey, we we have a really important. Welcome to the morning show. Yes. Here at Faith Church. I'm David. Bernie Reno. Nice to meet you. And, uh, uh, well, uh, we've been on before. We've been on. Nice but, to meet but, you, but, nice but to see it you. might be your first time today. Could be. And if it's your first time, it's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. I keep saying I'm going to have Facebook pulled up so mm-hmm. we can like chat back and forth. Chat back. Well, that would be interesting. Mm-hmm. But uh, Justin's pulling it up. If you pass your phone over here, Justin, I'll... Um, I'll chat with people because what I want to know is I'm, I'm today I'm I have one I'm, I'm a one track mind kind of guy. If I get an idea in my head, uh-huh. we're going. Which and it's, it's eclipse right eclipse now. Eclipse, well, yes. yes, and I you know think- it's interesting the, the difference with the eclipse. You it's a it, it's only a couple minutes long, but I guess it's a four hour process. But uh-huh. I mean it's a couple minutes long, and cloud cover is so tricky. Right. You know, and we are not in the path of totality here, but I think it's like. 95% yeah, Something like that. Mm-hmm. There's going to be some high clouds coming in. I think our time frame is somewhere around 3 o'clock or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some high clouds coming in here. You know, it's always tricky because mm-hmm. it's a small location in the mm-hmm. sky. But I think mm-hmm. I think around here it's like a 50 to 60% cloud cover here mm-hmm. tomorrow. Farther east in Ohio, mm-hmm. 30, 40%. And there's mm-hmm. going to be an area in the Midwest where it's fine. But, yeah, it's, 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 it's an amazing – people say it's a very spiritual thing. I've heard amazing things. I've about. heard amazing things with that when, mm-hmm. when you're in the to- uh, path of totality and it just turns cloudy. And what, and how I understand it, unlike Kentucky 2017, mm-hmm. the the moon will be cl- so close to the Earth it'll it 100. Yeah, like you can stare right it's at a it. It's better. It's, they, they still say you can't. What? You have, to have your glasses on. Even when I'm in the totality. That's what Even people say. That's what doctors say because they say. Doctor Seuss. I, Who? Yeah, what doctor? No, no, I've, I've talked to many doctors and they said <laughs> that uh, the last time in 2017 there were people that just stared at it and they actually had the imprint of the eclipse on their eyes. Um, uh, it was on their iris. I don't think you can lose your sight, but you can damage your eyes. So you really do need to have the glasses. That's what I'm told. Okay. Well, I don't. I don't. Okay. Well, I'm gonna. I was really hoping you were gonna give me better news. No, that I can't give you. But now, listen, I'm not a doctor, but that's what doctors have uh, that I've talked to have told. Me. Aren't you a doctor of meteorology? Uh, no, I'm not uh, a doctor. I only have a bachelor of science, uh, not a PhD. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bachter. Bachter. Yeah. Bachter. Yeah. Dr. Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to say bast, back, like a bastard in meteorology. We don't want to go that way. That's true. Certainly, also, yeah. This is a PG show. That's and true. So we can't yeah. say. And we're in church and it's Sunday, so we're not going in that direction. <laughs> yeah. um, so, Bernie, so you said for, well, my family and I will be in Wellington. I don't know if you saw Yeah, I saw where you're going to go. I think mm-hmm. there it gets better and better. Mm-hmm. I think it's cloudy in the morning and then there's less clouds in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Here it's the total opposite. I think it's sunnier in the morning and then the clouds come in. During the afternoon, you're going to AccuWeather.com. <laughs> you're going to Wellington, Ohio. Well, so here, here's my question for yeah. you, and, and let us know in the chat uh, if you're going if you're going somewhere to see the eclipse. Let us know in the chat in the comment section where you're going. I'd love to uh, interact with you a little bit afterwards. I don't have Facebook on my phone right now, so I can't do it right now. But um, so if I'm looking in Wellington, Ohio, that's Sunday. You gotta go to Monday. Thank you, thank you. Hourly going down here, Monday. and at the 3 p.m. time-ish, it's still s- saying. 70%. I think it's better than that myself. I don't know where I went. Hold on a second. 3 p.m. Monday. Stacy just said we're cracking we're cracking up their family at home. Oh, so I'm glad. glad. Thank you, Stacy. Glad you make you laugh. Appreciate it. <laughs> I still I think it's a little better than that. It's a little better. I think than it's so. a better a little better than that. We'll see how that works, but you know, mm-hmm. I'll cover such a tricky thing. I still think it's about 30 to 40 percent. Mm-hmm. What are you gonna Okay. Be? So we're still debating. We got to roll here, um, but we're still debating. If Indianapolis has like a 10% cloud cover, that's Indianapolis will be better. Will be better. So it'll be absolutely. A, it'll be four the hours. The farther west you go, the better you're going to be with the cloud cover. My son really wants us. He's like, let's drive, Dad. It's yeah. only four more hours. I'm like, well, well, well he's not the one doing the driving. He said he hates driving the no, car. No. Though. He's like, it's eight hours versus 20 years of waiting for the next eclipse. That's true. So I was like, you know, hey, we're going to get started in a minute and 20 yep. seconds. Uh, we want to give you guys a minute, also me a minute to get up on the platform. Well, you, you know, it's amazing how quickly you get up there. You're off and the next thing you know, you're on the guitar and I'm still rounding up. I'm running up out of time though. We're going to yeah. get started in just a minute.
God is good. And all the time. Welcome to Faith Church. My name is David Carter, and I'm one of the pastors, and it's a, it's a joy to be able to worship together today. Uh, whether you're here with us in the room or if you're worshiping with us online, uh, it, is, it truly is a joy to be able to gather together today and to sing God's praise, to gather together as a community, but also to hear, um, to hear a, little bit of, a little bit from his word and, and, and the life that he calls us to live and a little bit about his character, which is... Uh, kind of how we lead our lives. Um, a couple of announcements as we get started today. Uh, the first one is that if you're new here to the Life of Faith Church, we would love to help you make Faith Church your church home. We'd love to help you find belonging and community and purpose here. Uh, and one of the best ways that you can do that is by filling out the new here card. It's found right in front of you in the pew. Uh, if you fill that out, you drop it off in the offering box, uh, and then we'll reach out to you later today to just start a conversation and help you find uh, your, your place here at Faith Church. Um, and if you're online, you can also find that um, online at belfontfaith.com slash bulletin. Um, also, if you've been worshiping with us for some period of time and, and you're kind of ready to more fully um, get more uh, introduced to who we are as a church, we have a Belong workshop coming up on April 20. First at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And our Belong Workshop is just an introduction to who we are. Um, it's an opportunity to meet some staff um, and also to understand kind of uh, who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Um, and so we'd love for you to come to the Belong Workshop if you haven't done that yet. Um, you can sign up out in the lobby on the clipboard or you can sign up online for that as well. Now, if you're interested in becoming a member of Faith Church, our Belong Workshop serves as our membership class. But if you attend, you're not obligated to uh, join by any means. Uh, that's only one of the purposes of the workshop. Um, we also wanted to remind, let you know that um, you probably know that our youth um, group is going to Costa Rica for a mission trip this June. And um, we are going to be doing a fundraiser coming up on April 28th. We're going to be having a paint and praise night. Now it's kind of like sip and paint, but minus the sip. And plus some praise. And by praise, we're not going to have a worship service or anything. It's just going to be an opportunity to fellowship. And we've got the alliteration going on there. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and so that'll be um, April 28th. It's going to be instructor-led um, painting session. All the supplies will be provided. And that'll be a fundraiser for the youth mission trip to Costa Rica. It's $25, and you can sign up for that out in the lobby. Um, or you can sign up online at belfontfaith.com slash bulletin, and there's a link to pay and everything like that online, so it's nice and easy for you. I would love to have you come out to that on April 28th. And the last thing I wanted to just bring to our attention is uh, I know a lot of you last week invited uh, friends or family, neighbors, coworkers to, to come to Easter worship with us. And I just wanted to invite you that if you invited someone and they came on Easter, um, a, a second invitation would go a long way. Um, so think about that. If there's someone you invited or you had with you in worship last week, maybe shoot them a text this week and say, hey, if you ever want to go back, you know, I'll be there this weekend. Um, that's just one of the ways that we can share our faith with um, people in our, in our circles, people that we love and care for. Um, and so I just want to encourage you with that as well, that uh, if you invited someone, invite them back next week. It'll be fun. All right, today we have a great opportunity uh, to sing to our God, to hear from our God, to give God thanks for who he is. So as we enter into worship, let's stand together and sing.
shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord.
God, we do give you thanks today because you have made a way through Jesus for us to commune with you, to fellowship with you, to, to talk to you. We're thankful that, that we are a people because of you sending Jesus, that we can come directly to you with the things that are weighing heavily on our hearts. We can come directly to you with uh, our pain, with our sorrow, with our hurt, with our fears, whatever they are. We can come directly to you and say, God, I need you to work in this situation. I need your hand of healing. I need your, your, your warm embrace. I need your touch. I need you to do a good thing in this situation where it doesn't seem like anything good can possibly come out of it. So God, thank you that we have the opportunity simply to, to come to you and ask for you to breathe miracles in our lives and in our stuff. And Lord, we, we lift those things to you, those places, those people, those things that, that need your hand of healing, that need a miracle. And God, maybe the only miracle you want to do in our situation is to transform our hearts and our perspective. Maybe the only thing you want to do is, is to help us know you better. And God, if that's the case, we, we pray that we would be open to that, that we would be willing to receive that, and that we would hear it and see it, and our lives would be changed because of it. That's why we pray every single, every single Sunday. Not our will, but yours be done. Because God, we trust in you. We trust in your hand, we trust in your work, we trust in your way. Even when we don't understand, even when things don't go the way we hoped and prayed. And so God, it is with that in mind, that together we lift our voices praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. All right, well, hey, as you're having a seat, we want to invite the kids that are going to Children's Church. You guys can head down to the front door to meet Jeff Pilger, our children and youth director. Um, and we want to remind you that if there's ever anything uh, going on in life, um, in your life or a loved one's life, um, whether it's positive or negative, we'd love to be able to uh, share in that praying time with you. Uh, and you can submit a prayer request either by filling out the cards that are in front of you in the pews that say pray, uh, or you can fill out a prayer card online at belfontfaith.com slash bulletin, and our prayer team will be praying for you and lifting that up for you in the, in the coming week. Let me also uh, welcome you this morning. Uh, my name is Andy Morgan, one of the pastors here, and we are uh, so glad that you are uh, here to worship with us this morning, whether you are uh, here in person, whether you're joining us online, we are uh, grateful for your presence and the opportunity that we have to come together uh, to worship God together, to lift our voices up to God together. It is truly a blessing. Uh, we are beginning a new, uh, a new message series today, and um, we are going to be looking at the New Testament book of Philippians. It's actually a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Philippi. Um, it was a church that Paul helped establish. He kind of was the first one to take the gospel, the story, this message of Jesus and his death and resurrection. He took it to that city and to the people there, and um, that started the church. And so he wrote this letter to them. It's not a very long letter. It's only about four chapters long. I hope that you will read it. Um, you can read it all in one day, in one sitting, but you can also just read a chapter a week. We're going to be looking at um, a chapter every week. And one of the things that we're going to find is that in this very small letter to the Philippians, um, the, the Apostle Paul talks about joy 14 times. Joy, gladness. I mean, he talks, uses a word that we can connect with and associate with joy. And it doesn't tell us just about joy. It tells us how we can experience joy, gives us actually sometimes directions, guides us into how we can experience joy. Joy and happiness are not the same thing. Happiness depends on what happens in your life. It is very related to the circumstances we go through. Joy is, is lasting. Joy is a deep sense of maybe peace or well-being, a sense of gladness um, that 
does not depend upon our circumstances. So we're going to be talking about how we can find joy even in the midst of adversity. Because joy is about having the right perspective and at times making the right choices. Now, it might surprise people that Paul, the Apostle Paul, is the one writing so much about joy. Because if you looked at his life, you might not think that he would be an expert on joy or that he would even have experienced much joy in his life. This is what Paul said about his life. And I just want to preface what I'm about to read with, this took place after Paul had an experience with the risen Jesus. So Paul at one point in time was living his life and then he met the risen Jesus and everything changed for Paul after that. What we're going to hear from Paul about his life took place after he met Jesus. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is what Paul went through. Five times I received from the, Jew, from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles. I have been in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep, I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. He's the one writing about joy. So he's finding joy in the midst of adversity, in the midst of the struggles and the problems that he's experiencing. And what's important for us to remember is that what Paul is going through is after he kind of became a Christian, after he met Jesus. You see, we have this idea that once we accept Jesus, everything in our life should be good. God loves me, and so God's going to make everything work out the way that I want it to work out. That's often what we think. It's often what we experience. But that is not necessarily reality. When we accept Jesus, we, we hopefully will have something that will transcend some of the struggles and the problems we go through. That's what we'll find out with Paul. There was a sense of joy underneath it, but it was after Paul met Jesus that he struggled and that he wrestled and things did not go the way he would have wanted them to go. But he held on to his joy. And my hope is that through this series, our lives may not be what we want them to be. We may be going through our own adversity and struggles and trials. My hope is that we will be able to find some joy in the midst of that. Not happiness. Happiness depends on circumstances, but a sense of joy. Maybe an underlying sense of peace, well-being, gladness. Because we know if nothing else, God is with us. So it was Paul after experiencing the risen Christ, who writes about joy. And actually, Paul writes this letter while he's in prison. So Paul is sitting in prison, and he's going to be writing about how to experience joy. And Paul has great uncertainty about his life. He's in prison. He's awaiting trial. He doesn't know if the outcome is going to be more beatings. Maybe he'll be killed. Maybe he'll be set free. He has no idea what's coming. And yet in the midst of that uncertainty, in the midst of that adversity, he talks about joy. If you go back and look at Paul's first encounter with the people in Philippi, what happened to him when he first visited the city? What we're going to see is that Paul experienced joy in the midst of adversity. So Paul is on a missionary journey. A couple times, Paul would travel around and he would share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he is sharing this. And, he, and a lot of his journeys were in what today would be Turkey. We would say like Asia, or Asia Minor. Um, and Paul decides, he hears a call of God to go um, to what would, then was Macedonia. Today, it's Greece. First time the gospel actually goes to Europe. 
And so Paul goes to Macedonia. Philippi is the leading city. He goes to Philippi. And as soon as he gets there, he finds a woman who is a believer in God, had never heard of Jesus. He shares the gospel message with her. She immediately becomes converted and she and her entire household um, become Christians. Paul has like immediate success, like a great response. And so Paul goes around teaching and preaching and very quickly there's a another woman who begins to follow Paul and Silas. And and she is a woman who is possessed with, they say, a spirit of divination. Kind of a, people saw her as a fortune teller. She could maybe predict the future. And she made a lot of money for the people who kind of owned her. And she starts following Paul and Silas around everywhere they go. And she was shouting... These are men of God who are proclaiming the way of salvation. Now, first, that sounds good. A lot of free publicity, right? Everywhere they go, here's this woman shouting, these men, they know the way of salvation. They are from God. The problem was she was doing this constantly. And it says, Paul became very annoyed. I probably would too. And so Paul simply turns around and casts the spirit out of her, which means she no longer has the ability to tell people's fortunes, look into the future, which means the people who owned her no longer have any way to make money. They are not happy. They go and find Paul and Silas and drag them into the city courts, accuse them of stirring up all this kind of trouble. And the leaders of Philippi have Paul and Silas stripped naked and beaten and then thrown in prison. None of this seems to faze Paul. Paul and Silas are in prison, literally sitting with shackles, around their arms and around their wrists and around their ankles. They are in the innermost prison, part of the prison. Can't see anything outside. Probably didn't smell very good. They are in this wretched situation. And if you know the story, at midnight or during the middle of the night, they start singing. They start singing hymns of praise to God. In the midst of their adversity, suffering struggles, They've been stripped and beaten, thrown into prison in shackles. In the midst of their adversity, they are joyful. They're singing songs of praise. As they're singing, whatever was binding their hands and feet fell off. The door to the prison opened. Paul and Silas were set free. Joy set them free. Paul's experience in Philippi. Very soon after that, Paul leaves the city, keeps on traveling. So their time in Philippi wasn't very long. It was fairly short. During that time, they experienced great adversity, had joy in the midst of that, and the joy in the midst of that that adversity literally set them free. Paul knows something about experiencing joy in the midst of adversity. The people of Philippi know something about how to experience joy in the midst of struggles. That's, that's how Paul met these people. And Paul's letter to them is now written 10 years later. Paul has been traveling around. There have been more struggles. He was arrested. He's sent to Rome to stand trial. He's in prison in Rome. Everyone's concerned about Paul. All of these little churches that Paul helped set up, they're all worried about Paul. The church in Philippi was worried about Paul. So they sent one of their leaders, a man named Epaphroditus. They sent Epaphroditus to Paul with a gift. Don't know what the gift was. Money, food, clothing, warm blankets. We don't know. But they went, he went with a gift. Paul was so thankful for what they brought. Epaphroditus stayed in Rome for a while. Just because Paul was sitting in prison doesn't mean that he wasn't still sharing the gospel. Anywhere Paul went, he saw it as an opportunity. He's converting the jailers. He's sharing gospel. People are coming to visit him. He's sharing it with them. Epaphroditus was working with him for a while. He got, Epaphroditus got sick. They want to send him back home when he got better. And so 
It is this letter to the Philippians that Paul sends with Epaphroditus as he goes home. And this is how the letter starts. From Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all those in Philippi who are God's people in Christ Jesus, along with your supervisors and servants, may the grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers. I'm thankful for all of you every time I pray, and it's always a prayer full of joy. I'm glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed it until now. The very opening of this letter is how Paul began many of his letters. He saw himself as a servant of Christ Jesus, even a slave, like this is who I am and this is what I do. And I am owned by God Almighty. He shares grace and peace with the people who are there. That's kind of how Paul begins his letters. But he very quickly begins to talk about joy. And we see an awful lot about joy in the next few verses. So let's go back to verse 3. It says, I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers. I'm thankful for all of you every time I pray. And it's always a prayer full of joy. I'm glad, I'm joyful, because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed it until now. Right here, we learn an awful lot about joy. Joy comes from gratitude thankfulness. Joy comes from prayer, knowing that we can have a relationship with God, that we can communicate with God and that God is there for us. We're going to talk about gratitude uh, a little bit later on in the series, but let's just think for a moment about what is Paul grateful for? What's he thankful for? He tells us he's thankful for the people. He's thankful for Epaphroditus, who came and spent time with him. He's thankful for the church that sent Epaphroditus to be with him in the first place. Paul truly loved Epaphroditus. He called him a brother, a co-worker, a fellow soldier. Paul found encouragement from Epaphroditus. He, he lifted his spirits. There was so much joy he had in knowing that this man was working with him in the gospel. When Epaphroditus got sick, don't know what happened, but he got sick, almost died. And this is what Paul said when he, re, when he recovered. Paul said, God helped him recover so that I, Paul, would not have to experience sorrow upon sorrow. In other words, I loved this guy so much that if he was going to die, I'm already sitting in prison. This is already pretty sorrowful. I can't endure losing him. And thank God I didn't have to. He is that important to me. Paul is so grateful for the presence of Epaphroditus in his life. And he is grateful to the church, the people in Philippi who sense Epaphroditus to be with them in the beginning. Paul was thankful for the people of the church. He called them, hey, you have been partners with me from the moment you first heard about Jesus. Literally, Paul shows up in the city and there's a woman, Lydia, a business leader. She accepts the gospel like almost the first day. People joined Paul from the very beginning. Paul is so grateful for the church, for the people in Philippi. He wasn't even there that long, but they made an impact on him. He's so grateful that they were thinking of him when he was going through a difficult time. He was so thankful for the gift that they sent and the gift of Epaphroditus. Paul was actually encouraged by all of the people from all of the churches who came to visit him. At the very end of the book of Acts. So the book of Acts ends with the Apostle Paul sitting in prison. And at the very end of the book, it says that Paul welcomed all who came to visit him. See, there were people from all of the churches that Paul established. They were traveling to Rome to just see Paul, to encourage him, to visit him. And Paul's like, I am so, he welcomed everybody. It's like, I'm so grateful that you're here. I'm so grateful that you're a part of my life. You bring me joy. 
It's the people, it's the relationships that Paul is thankful for. And he gives thanks because they bring him joy in the midst of adversity. And the same is true for us. Where, where can we find joy in whatever we might be going through? In our relationships. In our relationships with one another. In our relationship with God. You've heard this before. You've heard it here before. But in our world today and in our culture, we are experiencing an epidemic of loneliness. And it is, it is making an impact in our lives. It's easy to blame COVID and all that happened with COVID. During COVID, you know, everything kind of changed and we found new ways to, what, have food delivered. Every restaurant now will deliver to you. It became very easy for us to sit at home and call for everything to be delivered. And so now we have our groceries delivered, we have our food delivered, we have our laundry delivered, we have packages delivered, we have everything delivered, which means I never have to leave my house. I never have to go to the grocery store and deal with people. I never have to have face-to-face -face interactions with people because everything can just be delivered. It's a convenience and it's great for many people in many situations, but we've also gotten kind of comfortable just staying home instead of going out and being with people. Zoom and all of those meetings that we used to have to go into the office and be face-to-face -face with people and interact with them, don't have to do that anymore. I can sit at home and you know what? The great thing is I can mute myself and I can mute others if I want to. <laughs> and, and so our interactions have changed we can put an avatar of us up and it's like, this is who you're, I'm going to be today. Or we can just, you know, go to blank screen and go off and do something else. Just be careful when you come back, you know. But we don't have to have those interpersonal relationships. We don't have to actually see people face to face. We see them screen to screen. Again, it can be very useful and very helpful. But it's isolated us. We don't have to have interactions with people. It's really easy to blame some of the dynamics of COVID. COVID was four years ago. In many ways, we've gotten comfortable. It's convenient. We're going to keep doing it. And we don't always see the negative impact. A lot of people also want to blame social media. We have, I always say, social media, we have the appearance, the illusion of many friends but we're actually not friends with anybody. We're not talking, we're not face-to-face, -face, we're not engaging, we're not connecting. Again, social media can be wonderful, can help us stay connected when we're, when we're far apart. But the reality is that social media does increase loneliness. Studies, studies have shown that heavy users of social media experience more loneliness than others. It's making an impact. That impact is not good. The loneliness that we are experiencing is not healthy. I read some studies this week that, again, I mean, I've heard some of this before, but some of it was new and it opened my eyes. Loneliness is as bad for our physical well-being as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Loneliness can lead to a 29% increase of heart disease, a 32% increase of stroke, a 50% increased risk of developing dementia. 50% increased risk of developing dementia. Why? Because we're not interacting with people. We're not having to use that part of our brain. We're not socially connected and we were created to be socially connected. God looked at Adam when he was alone and said, it's not good for man to be alone. And so he created a partner and a helper and, and, they, and they worked together and we were created to have those kind of relationships. And when we don't, we begin to decline. This was a statistic I had not heard and it's kind of sad. 40% of adults can go three days without having any face-to-face -face conversations with people. 
I mean, if you don't have a lot of family at home, if you're working all virtually, if you don't have to leave your house and you can just order online and they do the contactless delivery, yeah, you could go three, four, 10, 12 days without any face-to-face conversation. It's making an impact. If we want to experience joy, one very simple thing that we can do is to intentionally work on building relationships with other people. I mean, it really is that simple. It's not simple. Particularly for those of us who might be an introvert. COVID was great. I don't have to deal with people. I can just stay at home. It's all wonderful. But even for introverts, it's not always wonderful. There is a negative impact. And so it's not always easy, but it's a simple thing. If we want to experience joy, we need to intentionally build relationships with other people. A great place to do that, to build those kind of relationships, is right here. It's the church. We were created, I mean, the church was created as a community of people who believe and encourage and love and help and support one another. One of the articles that I read this past week on loneliness said one of the causes of loneliness is the decline of faith-based institution and community groups. So things like, you know, Rotary, Lions, Elks, all of those community groups, people aren't joining those anymore. They're on the decline most Faith-based organizations, a lot of churches are in decline. We don't have those interactions with one another. And we're suffering because of it. This is the, the best place, in my opinion, this is the best place to be connected with people. One of the reasons we encourage people to be part of a small group... I, I I firmly believe we develop faith most effectively in small groups where we can talk about it and share one another and find encouragement from one another. So yes, one of the reasons we encourage people to be part of a small group, a Bible study, Sunday school class, a serve team, a, a, a mission team is to learn and grow and develop in our faith. But honestly, maybe right now we need to be a part of a small group for the personal connection, the face to face communication, just sitting down in a room Any connection with people in and through the church can be life-giving and can increase joy. We're starting several fresh expressions. A fresh expression is really kind of a a small group that is, is seeking to take the gospel and take the church out into the world to engage people who may never walk into a building for whatever, a church building for whatever reason. And we're starting some fresh expressions built around Uh, things that people love to do. And so we have, for example, a hiking fresh expression. If you love to go hiking, if you just love, you want to start hiking and you want to get out there, sign up to be part of that fresh expression. Help create something. There's a running fresh expression. If you love to run or maybe you want to start running with people and you want to experience that, see what that fresh expression is all about. Being part of a, a fresh expression can increase joy. Serving in the church can be a place where we increase joy because we just begin to get to know people. We have a mission week coming up in May. All local work. If you can work just an afternoon or an evening or if you can work all mornings during the week or if you can work all the time, be sign up, be a part of it. Get to know the people you're working with. Get to know other people from the church. I guarantee you, you'll have a good time. The people who lead it are wonderful and you're going to meet other people and it's just going to be a great experience, but it'll increase joy just because you're in conversation and relationship with more people. And we'll bring joy to the people that we're serving and helping and in ministry to. If you want to reach out to those in assisted living facilities, people who are more shut in at home and maybe don't have the opportunities for those face-to-face conversations, you can check in with Leanne Showers. She would love to talk to you about how to visit people, get to know them and build relationships with them. And, and you will bring them joy, but I guarantee this, you will receive joy in the process. 
Unfortunately, youth are prone to experiencing more loneliness. We have a fresh expression that's going to be starting this summer that's going to be reaching out specifically to teenagers. Teenagers in the community, it's a desire to build community, to offer some sense of, hey, you're not alone in life. You can come and have a meal and then maybe, you know, play some games or do some crafts or just have some conversation, but get to know people. Vicki Shawley would love to talk to you about being part of that fresh expression. There are opportunities to connect, to build relationships literally all around us in the church and in the community with partner missions and ministries. We have a great working relationship with Bridge of Hope. And I know, I know they are looking to put together a community group You will experience joy if you work as part of a community group that's seeking to offer hope and encouragement to a single mom. Opportunities are all around us. We just have to be willing to intentionally build those relationships. A simple process, I get it, it's not easy to do. We've become kind of comfortable. We've also grown lonelier. Increase joy. We have a praise and paint night. Same day we're doing a bake sale. Be a part of either one. Reach out to to the church and we'll let you bake something. And just as you're baking something, you're going to bring joy to someone because you're going to have to bring it into the church and see someone face to face. I mean, there's going to be some connection. Paint and praise just Enjoy the connectedness of being with other people as you work on a masterpiece that you can take home and frame and put up in your house. Getting involved, building relationships, it brings joy. There is a second source of joy that Paul talks about in the first part of his letter to the Philippians. So this is, again, Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. Paul says, I will continue to rejoice... I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul knows whatever I'm going through right now, whatever adversity I'm facing can be used for good if God's a part of it. And I know God's a part of it. So whether I live or die doesn't matter. God's going to be glorified. To live is Christ. There may be some adversity, but there's joy in that. To die is gain. Paul had this perspective. I know that what I'm going through, somehow God can use for good doesn't mean that what I'm going through is good. Many times what we're going through is terrible. But there's this understanding that because of the resurrection, God can use this for something good. The Easter message we heard last week, the worst thing is never the last thing. The worst thing might be the next to the last thing, but there's always the last thing which is better which is good. Even Paul says, to live is Christ. If I'm going to live in prison and even in prison maybe be executed, I'm going to find joy because I'm living with Christ and in Christ. And when I die, it's just gain because there's a resurrection. The worst thing we go through is never the last thing. The adversity that we're going through can glorify God. It can be used for good. What we have to do is wrestle with this question. What is the opportunity I can find in this adversity? What's the opportunity that I can find? The possibility, something good that can come out of it, that I can find in this adversity. God is always at work redeeming situations, making them better. Every adversity we go through has the potential to be used for good. The Bible says, I believe, 
that God is working for the good in all things. Not all things are good, but God is working for the good in all things. What's the possibility, the opportunity, the blessing that you can identify as coming out of the adversity you're going through? I am always amazed and humbled by the families that can take a tragedy and turn it into a triumph in another family. The death of a child in one family might raise awareness that can help a child in another family. Support groups that talk about how do, I, how do I make it through a battle with cancer and chemotherapy and radiation? How do I make it through this? How do I, how do I deal with the grief and the sadness and the pain of loss? How do I overcome addiction? Support groups are so important in this process to help people find life. And the only reason those groups work is because there's someone who's willing to go there and tell their story. You may be one of those people and you're going through the tragedy, but God is going to bring you to a place where maybe you can share your story to be an encouragement to help someone else find victory. What is the opportunity that I can find in the midst of this adversity? If we truly believe that the worst thing is never the last thing, then whatever we're going through right now is going to be redeemed There's going to be something good that will come. Even if it's people who maybe just see that the reality of their health situation is that death is going to be the answer. But they're filled with joy because they know that there's something better beyond death. I've had the blessing of just being able to sit and be with so many people who face the reality that a loved one is dying and it's, a, it's horrible, it's sad, it's, it's filled with grief. But many of them also say, but you know what, I have hope. Because I know this isn't the end for them or for me. No matter what we're going through, If we believe that the worst thing is not the last thing, then joy is possible. Sometimes it's a perspective. God can bring something good out of this. Sometimes it's a choice. I gotta build a relationship with someone else. I gotta step out of being comfortable in what's convenient and actually maybe go to the grocery store and interact with people or go to a restaurant and be blessed by a server and offer a blessing to someone else. And I need to engage people again. Sometimes it's a perspective. The worst thing is never the last thing. Sometimes it's a choice. I'm going to build a relationship with someone in the life of the church and learn and grow in the process. I encourage you in the midst of this epidemic, choose joy. Choose joy. Look for joy. Look for opportunities. Build relationships because that will bring you joy. And find joy in Jesus. He's the one who connects us into a relationship with God where our sin separated us from God. Jesus returns us into a relationship with God where we can pray, where we can lift our hearts to God, where God can pour himself into us. If nothing else, find joy in Jesus and allow that to begin to change who you are, to change your life, your family. Choose joy. Would you pray with me? God, I pray that we would, in the midst of our adversity and struggles, in the midst of maybe feeling tired and worn out and run down, I pray that we would make 
a decision today to choose to find joy in our lives. God, help us to find the opportunity and the possibility in the midst of the adversity we are going through. Help us to step out of our sense of isolation and loneliness and step into relationship with others. God, help us to build relationships with one another. And may, and may the church, which was such a blessing to Paul, may the church, which is a gift from you, may the church be a, a place where we can experience joy in relationship with one another. And we ask all this and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus gathered with his, uh, with his disciples, his friends, at the Passover meal, the last meal he, he served or, or ate with them, one of the gospels says that Jesus said to his disciples, I have eagerly anticipated sharing this meal with you. Jesus is like, I couldn't wait to be with you. I couldn't wait to share in this meal with you. Because Jesus knew something about the importance of relationship. There's going to be joy that I'm going to experience in the meal. And so when we come to the table, we know we're not eating alone. We know we're coming with other people. We know that there are those around us and we experience joy. It's a reme this is a meal that reminds us that there's also nothing that can separate us from God. Our sin at one point separated us. We think that our life and, and, our, and the choices we make can separate us from God. We know in Jesus that we have been reconciled, we have been deemed, we've been restored into a relationship with God. And if nothing else, that relationship can bring joy. So this is a meal where we can be connected to God. This is a meal we know we share with one another. Therefore, this can be a place where we experience joy. As we gather at the table, I invite you to simply continue to evaluate your life. If there's, if there's isolation or brokenness that you need to confess, just lay it before God. If there is strength or courage that is needed to move forward in life, ask for God's spirit. But let us come to, before God knowing that this is the place where joy can enter our lives. Would you pray with me? Hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. This proves how much God loves us and that we are saved by grace alone through the faith, our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The night before the incredible adversity Jesus was going to face, the suffering of denial and betrayal, the physical suffering of crucifixion, gathered with his friends, experiencing the joy at the table, Jesus took bread. And after he gave thanks to God, he gave it to his disciples and he said, take indeed all of you. This is my body, which is given for you. Every time you eat this, remember me. And then likewise, Jesus took the cup and after he gave thanks to God, he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and drink from this all of you. This is my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink from this, remember me. We remember Jesus in this meal. We remember that he gave himself for us so that we could experience the fullness of a relationship with God and the joy that brings. I love that Jesus did not eat this meal alone 
he shared it with all those he loved. This is a meal of the community. We share it together. You'll walk forward with one another. We share in this meal together and we find joy. Even those who may be joining us at home, I hope you feel a sense of connectedness as you share in a meal that we all share in together. This truly is what we remember in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us gathered together in your name and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we might experience the presence of Christ and so that we might be the presence of Christ, the body of Christ in our world. God, as we join together today, may we find joy in our relationship with you and joy in our relationship with the church that you have created. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This truly is the body of Christ, which has been broken and given for you. And this is the blood of Christ. It is the cup of salvation which brings joy to you. As those who are going to serve come forward uh, today, we want to remind you that uh, this meal is open to anyone and everyone as they um, are able to uh, experience the, the goodness and the grace of God. Um, this is um, a meal truly for all people, and you are welcome at the table. All the elements are gluten-free. Um, if you would uh, prefer prepackaged elements, um, some of those will also be available at the center um, of the sanctuary this morning. But truly, um, all things are prepared. Joy awaits us in the fullness of Jesus.
Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for just meeting us at the table. We thank you for once again um, being present to be in a relationship with us. We thank you for the forgiveness and the grace that you offer us through your body and blood that allows us to be in a relationship with God, our Father. And that also helps to create the body of Christ, the church. May we truly find joy in knowing that whatever we're going through today, whatever adversity or struggles we face is, is not the last thing. That truly to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And God, help us to keep reaching out to you and to one another so that we would experience the joy found in relationships with one another. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. As we close today, we're going to just remember and celebrate and give thanks for uh, God's faithfulness, um, his loving presence, his constant, um, never-changing nature that is with us through anything we face, which is a significant portion of why we can find joy no matter what we're facing today, as Pastor Andy uh, said um, uh, just a few moments ago. And so as we close, we're going to sing Firm Foundation. I love that bridge. It says, rain came and wind blew. It doesn't say this, but, but I had joy because my house was built on you. So let's stand together and have joy and remember God's faithfulness.
man, as we go from here, man, you know the love and the grace and the presence of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And may who he is and his presence in your life fill you with joy. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. See you next week.